and you have to write your you have to mark your quiz as right or wrong. Okay, so you have a drawing or you don't. If you don't have a drawing, it's wrong. If you have a drawing, it's right if it looks like this. <laughs> okay, now are there any questions about uh, that? Yes. Okay, so what's the question? How did we get this drawing? So first of all, let's go back to make the rotation zero. So let's start out with the case where there's no rotation and run this program. And here's the picture we get. What is this picture? How do I hide this thing? What is this picture? It's, uh, it goes from x equals zero, y equals zero, that's this point, to x equals one, y equals zero, that's that point, and up to x equals zero, y equals one, that's that point. So here's the drawing. It connects these three points, and this is the drawing before we rotate it. Then we take this drawing, and we rotate it pi over two, or in, in uh, high school language, 90 degrees, and then uh, it, it takes that picture and rotates it around like this. All of the x coordinates turn into y coordinates, and all the y coordinates turn into minus x coordinates. That's the 90 degree rotation. Okay, now, if you got it right, vote A, and if you didn't get it done, or you got it wrong, vote B. Now, if you want to give yourself full credit, double A or A plus, you would have had the scale in here from minus two to two, and you would have showed these grid lines uh, also. Okay. Do you want to see how you guys did? <laughs> Pretty good. Now, I don't know how this would be different if I had your neighbor grade what you did, but, but. Um, well, if you're cheating, that's, it's your loss in the end, somehow or other. Because God, God, God is watching, or something like that. Um, so A is, the, uh, A is the right answer, supposedly, if I can get A to be recorded here. I have to stop voting. Now, can I... There we go. Okay, so now I'd like to go on and uh, do some more with animation and differential equations, and then we're going to go on to talk about uh, angular velocity. So let me hide the uh, eye clicker here. That's not what I intended. So uh, let's look at a problem which you just handed in for homework, which was the uh, pendulum problem. And here is my uh, solution to that pendulum equation, at least the numerical part of it. Uh, let me emphasize again something I've said many times, uh, but now you're coming up to fall break. So it's an opportunity for those of you who are not really playing along with MATLAB. So what it means to play along with MATLAB is that after you've gotten all the help you can get, you should be able to do the whole assignment from beginning to end without looking at a sample, without looking at the book, without asking anybody for help. You should, you should be able to turn on MATLAB and there by yourself write the programs and get them to run. You will get many errors. For, this, for what I'm going to show you today, I had probably 20 errors before I came to class of all kinds of little kinds. Finding those errors and fixing the errors is incredibly frustrating. But the only way you are going to be competent at doing these problems is by getting stuck on those errors for two minutes, five minutes, 20 minutes, over and over again, till you learn what the problems are. Now, I, I don't know whether I'm talking to half the class or a quarter of the class, but I know I'm talking to many of you. We give you sample problems. You have friends who will help you. Uh, they're old samples you can look at. If you're doing the homework that way, you are not learning what you're supposed to learn. It's okay to learn that way, but in the end, you should be able to do all the things from beginning to end by yourself. Okay, so here, that means when you watch the lecture, you should be thinking, what is it I don't understand? Ask questions during lecture, after lecture, office hours. Anyway, here is approximately uh, what you should have done uh, for the homework that you handed in Tuesday. It's solving this pendulum equation. Let me just jump to the key part of this, <coughs> is what are the differential equations for the pendulum? We put those in a program we call uh, the right-hand side. This should be uh, pendulum right-hand side. It actually uh, worked without that because 
it goes by the name of the file rather than the name of uh, what's written up here, but it's certainly bad to write it like that. So we pass in the parameters, which for a pendulum are the mass, gravity, and the length. Uh, we're going to call the first column, uh, the first element of z theta, and the second one omega. And then what are the differential equations for the simple pendulum? Is that the rate of change of theta is omega, and the rate of change of omega is minus g over L sine theta. These are the pendulum equations which I derive for you, and then in the case of the inverted pendulum, uh, Pranav is derived for you four different ways, and you've done in homework many different ways. These are the pendulum equations. They're nonlinear differential equations. You, if you can solve them by pencil and paper, uh, you probably don't belong in this class. Uh, I cannot. I guess I could set, set up some integral, but, but it's, uh, it's just, this is a nonlinear differential equation. Don't try separation of variables or anything else. You will probably just get into trouble. Anyway, here's what's returned. Uh, and that means we can solve this differential equation. Now back to how do we solve the equation. We have to put in initial conditions because you're going to start initial uh, differential equation somewhere. You get different answers depending how you start it, just like any machine or thing in dynamics, depending on how you start it, it moves a different way. Always obeying the same equations, but how it moves depends on how you start it. So you have to put in the initial conditions. Then we're going to solve this. How do we solve it? We solve it here. In this case, I'm using our RK2 solver. Uh, which I can show you, but I'm not going to. But this was Euler's method improved by taking a half a step, looking at the derivative there, and then using that to take a whole step. You should be able to write that by yourself. We put the right-hand side in a file we call pendulum right-hand side. We pass that into this. It's always looking up what is the, what is the rate of change given the current state. We put in the T-span, the initial conditions, and so on. Our vulnerability is blocked. Uh, we put in uh, N for the number of points that we're going to integrate, and we pass the parameters to that right-hand side, which uses the gravity, the length, and so on. After we solve it, the first column of the solution is theta. The second column, probably I should call it omega to be consistent, or it's theta dot. And then I can plot, for example, uh, the angle versus time. So I run this, and I can see uh, what the solution is. And it looks like an oscillating pendulum. And how long does it take to oscillate? Well, let's see, I started it out here with an angle of pi over 2. That's a pretty big angle. If instead I put in an angle of uh, uh, 0.1, let me put even a very small angle, 0.01, and instead of going to 30, let me go up to 6 times pi, 6 times pi. And with the parameters I put in here, I should get just three nice oscillations if, if it was an exact linear pendulum. And for very small angles, it's very close to the exact linear pendulum, very close to three oscillations. This is a quiz question from last class. On the other hand, if I put in a big angle, like, uh, like almost pi, pi uh, minus uh, 0.1, so it's almost upright, and then I run this um, pi minus 0.1. Do you see typical syntax error? Does anybody see what the problem is? I've got a space there, so it looks like two numbers. Pi, and I want one number in there, pi uh, minus 0.1. I don't actually need brackets here anyway, so it's probably the brackets are left over from when the initial condition had a list of numbers from the satellite problem. Then I could put the space back again. It doesn't make, it doesn't make trouble. Run this again. And then I get, in the same amount of time, I only get about one oscillation. And I could get it slower still if I put in 0.01, and then it's almost upright and it barely even starts to fall down, then it gets, what is this, what is this flat part down here when theta's not changing? That's just going all the way around and almost up to the other side, and it's holding up there, and then it goes zoop, and it's about to pop down. So this value here corresponds to, in terms of the way we measured angles, almost negative pi, and there it is at almost negative pi. Negative pi would be just a shade below here. Okay, now, let's say we wanted, any questions about this so far? Yes? Questions? Well, it's actually not so much about the code, but more like when a, a pendulum is all the way up, why does it sort of like... Hang up there? Yeah. Well, let's say you put it exactly upright, then that's an equilibrium solution. So if you had it exactly upright, you say it's unstable. If you try to take a, a, a stick and a ball and put it upright, you walk away, it falls down. But the more accurately you get it exactly upright, the longer it sits up there. That is an equilibrium solution. So if you look, for, if, you want to get, if you want to think about it mathematically, 
if you look at the inverted pendulum equations, which have theta double dot is plus g over L sine theta, look at the small angle approximation of that, is theta double dot is, is equal to theta, or proportional to theta, that has exponentially growing solutions. And if you start with a very teeny thing, it's some teeny number times e to the t, and it takes a long time before it blows up. Okay, so this, these, this solution here is actually very closely approximated by an exponential increase of this angle relative to this, uh, this number here. Does that address your question? Yes. Okay, any other questions? Yes? You have to write a function. Say again? You have to write this pendulum description as a function. Uh, this is a MATLAB uh, defect, I would say, is that if you are going to be calling a function, and it's a function, <coughs> it's even more complicated. This could be a script. If I wanted to put this right-hand side in the same text file, then it has to be a function. That's just a MATLAB hang-up. Does that address your question? Now that I'm calling an, ex calling an, an, an external file, it can be a script. Okay, now I want to show you two different modifications of this. One, I want, to sh I want to plug in the animation stuff I showed you last time. And second, I want to get you away from this pathetic RK2 code that we wrote is way, way better than the Euler method code, but, there's, but, but people at MathWorks are much smarter than that, and you can just use their code instead. So I want to show you how to replace our private integration code with the official uh, published code, hundreds of lines long, much more accurate, much better than this RK2. Okay, so first I'm going to show you the animation. So let me just show you the result of the animation. I have a separate function I've called animate pendulum, and now I'm going to do the same problem again. Let me put in some small smaller initial conditions, like how about pi over 2? That's, that's one that we can sort of recognize whether things are going right or wrong. And uh, I am going to uh, run this code again. Okay, so what I've done there is I've got a program and I pass in the list of angles and list of times, and I plot it, but I plot it in this different way. And you are getting very virtually sleepy as you watch this virtual pendulum. And if you want to watch it in that, in that case where uh, we had uh, pi minus point uh, 01, we can see how this thing works. Let me not do uh, quite so many oscillations here. How about just uh, 2 times pi? And we can watch how this thing looks. Run it again. So now we start it almost upright. And it takes a long time to get going. Eventually, the more it tips, the bigger its angular acceleration. The bigger its angular acceleration, the faster it tips. The faster it tips, the more the angle changes, and it goes faster and faster and faster and faster, and faster and faster and faster and faster, and, faster. and then the clock ran up. Okay. Okay, now we'd like to see how does this animation work, and what I've done is I've just modified the code from last class to serve this particular problem. So I've got my coming in is a list of times that I'm going to make a plot and a list of angles and the parameters. From those parameters, I'm going to extract the length of the pendulum. I'm going to say, how many points am I plotting for? I have a list of angles and a list of times. I could have put the length of t. I could put the length of theta. It doesn't matter here because both of those have the same length. So I could put t here instead. Now I'm going to draw my pendulum. I want to draw this cute little shape here. I'm going to draw it in the reference configuration the coordinate system I've used for my head, which is different from MATLAB plotting, is that down is x and to the right is y. And I did that so that the polar coordinates theta would be related to x and y in a conventional way. x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. And I don't have to rethink that for every problem. Now, some problems you're going to have to rethink it, but just for convenience I did that. So I have my reference configuration is straight down, and I want to draw this little shape. So I start here at the origin for x, I go down a distance L, then I draw this point over here in this reference configuration, which when this is straight down is over to the side a little bit. Over to the side uh, corresponds to uh, Y coordinate in my, in, my, in my view, so it's the same X coordinate. Then I go down a little further, that's going down to this point. Then I stay down there and go over to this point, and then up to this point, and then back to this point. 
And all that while the y values, which are to the right on this plot in my brain, not in MATLAB's brain, but in my brain, the way I set up the pendulum equation, I had y coordinates of 0, 0, then I went to the right, then I went straight down, so I had the same y coordinate. Um, then, I, then I went to the left with the y coordinate, and then straight up, and then back to the origin. And this is a, this is a drawing of this shape in the straight down position. Any questions about this drawing here? Why did I put eps? Because I didn't know how big a box would look good, and I didn't want to have to keep typing numbers on again and again, so I called it eps so I could draw a smaller, bigger box. Any questions about this drawing here? Okay, now I've put in figure two, because I, even though I'm animating it, I still might want to see how things look as a function of time. Uh, <coughs> how am I going to animate it? For every time, I'm going to make a plot. So how many times do I have? I have n of them. I have a pause in here in case I want to control the speed. Oftentimes it just doesn't run fast enough so you just put a very tiny pause here. I'm going to take my original picture and I'm going to rotate it. This is the rotation matrix. Uh, I take my picture and I rotate it by multiplying by the rotation matrix. I pull out the x and y coordinates as the, as the first and second row of my picture and then I plot it in this peculiar way and this is because MATLAB's concept of x and y is different than my concept of x and y. What I called x was down, and what MATLAB calls down is negative y. So where they had y, I put my negative x. And what I called to the right, which MATLAB thinks of x, I called it x, MATLAB calls it, I mean I called it y, MATLAB calls it x. So this in a sense is a rotation, but I'm not thinking of it as a rotation, I'm just thinking of it as we have different names for the different axes. And then I make the plot and I run this. If I want to make it look uh, nicer again, I don't use this funny initial condition. I'll go back here to, uh, how about three uh, times pi uh, divided by two. Three pi over two is uh, up uh, pi over two. Yes, yeah, so this looks like a good one. And then I run this again. Oh, 3 pi over 2, that was way over there. Oops, that's not what I meant. But it's okay. So I started it wrapped all the way around over here, and so it fell down this way. So my plot of the angles is going to look funny. What happened to my figure 1 and my figure 2? I don't know. Get rid of these things. Okay, any questions about um, this animation program? Okay, that's just putting together two things you should, should know already. Animation you know from last class, and how to solve ODEs, you should know that pretty well by now. Okay, now I want to go back to this thing, and we have our solver here, RK2. Uh, RK2 was uh, this thing that we wrote. It was our, our uh, differential equation solver. The key of this solver was that we marched forward in time by taking a new value of z by h times what we thought was the derivative. How do we take the derivative? We take a half step forward and estimate the derivative. It's a little tune-up of, of uh, Euler's method. Now, what is wrong with that uh, program that, that, uh, that we have? Uh, one thing is that we're just not very sophisticated. And the si so, like, we made an improvement by making, by going from making a, a, taking the derivative and going one step to, like, looking ahead a little bit and seeing how things are changing and then taking a step. Well, we can look ahead in a more and more sophisticated ways. So, typically, when people are solving differential equations, they make two or three different guesses, or four or five, and they get much more accurate prediction of what's happening at the next step. And these are called runge-cutted methods. The most commonly used one is runge cut of four, which is takes four guesses. It sort of looks ahead, makes a guess, uses that to look ahead and make another guess, uses that to look ahead to make another guess, takes come some kind of weighted average, uses that to make a guess. It's what's called a fourth order accurate method, which means that if you take uh, a, a, your mesh size 10 times smaller, it gets 10,000 times more accurate. So with Euler's method, you take the guess 10 times smaller, get 10 times more accurate. With our RK2, we made it 10 times smaller, got 100 times more accurate, which was a lot more accurate. Remember, it ran a lot faster when we did this RK2. With this RK, if we use a fancier method, it becomes much, much more accurate with less calculation. Okay, that's one problem. Another problem with this, uh, 
uh, this little thing we have here is that we don't have independent control over the accuracy and how many points we get the output at. If we want it more accurate, we have to put more points here, and then we get all this extra output. It would be nice to have independent control of the accuracy and the output. Then there are other bells and whistles you might like. Like you might want to not stop at a certain time. You might want to stop when some variable gets to some value. Or we might actually like to control the accuracy directly. Rather than say we want it more accurate and we're going to use more points, we might be able to say we want it accurate to one part in 10,000 or 100,000 or a million or a billion. So these are all options we'd like, and these are all options that the official programs give you. So now what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to using the official program. We're going to replace our RK2 with MATLAB's version. So I just did that by switch. This is a switch from our version to MATLAB's version. Our version, MATLAB's version. And I'll point at the, all the things we switched. The main thing we switched is instead of calling RK2, we call RK23. And it's actually called ODE23 which means it's a combined second and third order method for solving ordinary differential equations, a MATLAB program. There's another program we could have, that people use uh, which is a little faster, more accurate, if you're, trying, if you're aiming for accuracy, it's ODE 4.5. Why would you use one or another? It's a subtle point, depending on whether you're more interested in speed or accuracy. For your purposes, they're the same, ODE 2.3 and ODE 4.5. This works both ways. Let's just stick with ODE 2.3. Before we put the name of our right-hand side in quotes, now we, we put the name of our right-hand side without quotes in this at symbol. Why do we do that? I do not know. That's just some MATLAB syntax thing. It's called anonymous functions. That at sign has to do with anonymous. I don't understand anonymous functions. All I know is that if you want to pass in the name of your right-hand side file into ODE23, you put the name after the at sign instead of putting it in quotes. If anybody understands what this is about, come to office hours or sometime, maybe not immediately after class, and explain it to me. I would like to know it. Now, you can pass into ODE23 two numbers for T-SPAN, but a better thing to do is to pass in all the times when you want to know the output. Why do you do that is because this ODE23 is constantly adjusting the time steps it takes to make the accuracy as good as it can. And then it gives you the output at all these funny times. And if you want to do at animation, you want to see the outputs at regular times. So the accuracy and the output times are two different things with ODE23. So we're going to say we want the output at all these times. So instead of passing into two numbers for the T-SPAN, we pass in a whole list of numbers. In this case, for the pendulum, it's 0 to 30 and n numbers, where n is 1,000. Now, we wrote our program that we, we put, we had like our accuracy variable here was n. In MATLAB, the accuracy variable is actually a giant list of options. There are about 30 different things you can pass in here. For now, let's just use the defaults. So we put in the empty brackets there. We're saying, just do what you want to do. But you have to put the empty brackets and you pass in the parameters. So before we had an n here, let me just show you that. Uh, pendulum, we had an n here for our accuracy variable. Now we're going to put in empty brackets. Later on, I'll show you some of the options you can put in. What we're going to use is the default accuracy, which I think is uh, so-called 10 to the minus 4, whatever an accuracy of 10 to the minus 4 means. Uh, then I think everything is the same. So I run this, and I, and I get, uh, if, if things are good, I just get the same uh, plot again. Okay, so it's a very small syntax change. Why is it such a small syntax? Why I'm getting two plots, I don't know. Why is it such a small syntax change? Uh, it's because I set you up that way. Remember, I was careful about the rows and columns of Z. That was because I was getting you organized for the syntax of this, uh, this ODE 23 and ODE 45. <coughs> okay, any questions about any of this MATLAB thing? What do you wish somebody else would ask? Yes? How was that animation passed? How was the animation passed? Uh, I never passed the animation back. So what happens is the animation program takes as input the list of times and the list of angles. And then the animation program just runs and it makes a plot. That's why was it faster? Why was the animation program faster? I, I don't think it was actually. 
uh, or if it was, it's for reasons that I do not know. So if I go back to pendulum, I have my thousand points. Uh, here I had zero to two pi. Uh, that was because I think I had my six pi. I, I, I was using six pi. Let me go back to my original one and do six pi. Uh, and this, this should run at the same, the animation should run at the same speed. Is it the same speed or is this? Should be the, it should, the animation program shouldn't see the difference. So if it's different, it's for reasons I do not know. Okay, who did you want to ask that question? I asked you to ask a question you wanted somebody else to ask, but not who was it that you want. Okay, never mind. Any other question? You, you, uh, yes? Uh, can I just see the uh, pendulum just uh, so I know like, what you pass into it? Like, some of the OD. Here's the pendulum program. Yeah. What you pass in to your, let's do the pendulum 2, so we'll move up to our uh, ODE 2.3. ODE 2.3 is MATLAB's differential equation solver. It has to know what the differential equation is. That's, the, that's that right-hand side thing that says what's the differential equation. It has to know when you're starting, when you're stopping, and when you want to know the output. It has to know the initial conditions. It has to know a bunch of stuff about the accuracy and so on, but it's got defaults. We'll use the defaults. And it has to know the parameters you're passing in. Yes? Well, what I was really wanting to know is how to set up the actual differential equation. Passing okay, the differential equation... Is, is the key, is the most important thing we're talking about in this class, and that's the differential equation for the pendulum. And then there's a bunch of stuff here having to do with passing it in as a list of variables and packing and unpacking and so on. But the most important part in terms of this course is this block of code here. Understanding what that means. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to stop this and I'm going to go to the blackboard. Off. Big, large center screen. Raise. So picture that uh, Pranav drew, and I drew, Pranav drew with polar coordinates, I drew it with uh, this rotated coordinate systems, is you draw a unit circle, and associated with this unit circle, we have an I base vector and a J base vector, and they're at right angles to each other, and these things we think of as fixed. So I'm going to use a capital script F to say that these are fixed, they are not changing in time. Then on our object, whatever object we're looking at, we have some vectors which are going to rotate with the object, and these we call I prime and J prime, and they're very analogous to what we called ER and E theta, but, uh, but they're not exactly the same. To say that exactly how they're the same and different, here we're thinking of this as a coordinate system that moves with the object rather than an arrow which is pointed at some specific point. ER is an arrow pointed at some specific point. Here we just have a coordinate system which is drawn on some object which rotates. <laughs> and so we have the theta like this. Now, we could just write here that I prime is equal to cosine theta I uh, plus sine theta J. And associated with that, we can say the components of I prime in the XY coordinate system are the list of numbers cosine theta and sine theta. And likewise, we have j prime is equal to, well, what is it? It's minus sine theta in the i direction and is plus cosine theta in the j direction. And associated with that, we can look at this j prime and look at its coordinates in the xy system. And those coordinates are minus sine theta and cosine theta. And from this, we put together our rotation matrix. In the rotation matrix, one way to think of it is as having two columns. 
one column is this i prime vector written in the xy system, and the other one is this j prime vector written in the xy system, or in 2D, it always works out the same. It's cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. These are just two different ways of thinking about this rotation matrix. One is its columns are the components of the rotated base vectors. And the other is just that it's a matrix that works out to tell us the rotations. So for example, if we take uh, the components of the I vector in the XY system and we multiply it by this rotation matrix, it gives us the components of I prime in the XY system. Or another way to say this is we take R and we multiply it by 1, 0, it gives us out cosine theta and sine theta. It's a change of, uh, if you like, it's very similar anyway to change of basis or change of coordinates matrix. Anyway, this tells us how uh, things uh, change. If we want to know the components of any vector, after it's rotated, we look at R times the components of that vector before it's rotated. So this is before rotation. And here are the components after the rotation. And this is what we just used for all of those uh, pictures that we drew. Now what we're interested in dynamics, and actually most dynamics books don't even talk about these rotations, because of this fact. What we're interested in dynamics is velocities and accelerations. And we can actually think about these velocity accelerations without thinking even very directly about rotations at all. So if you look at one special case, is let's just look at, so now we're interested in rates. One special case is let's look at this i vector, this i prime vector, and let's look at this rate of change. What is the rate of change of this vector here? Well, as theta changes, it changes from here to here. So in this picture, we have the i vector like this with a theta. It changes from here to here. Here is delta i prime. Here is i prime. And if we want to figure out what i prime dot is, it's the change in i prime divided by the change in time. And what that is is theta dot times j prime, just like er dot is theta dot times e theta. And you can work that out over here just by taking the time derivative of this expression, derivative of cosine is sine, so this turns into minus sine, so it turns into minus sine theta theta dot minus sine theta times theta dot, sine turns into cosine times theta dot with the chain rule, it gives us this result over there. Similarly, j prime dot is equal to theta dot times minus i prime. Now those formulas look confusing. Is there a way we can write those formulas so they both look uh, kind of symmetrical, that we don't have to worry about where the minus sign is? And there is which is that what is this rate of change of i prime is pointed in that direction. It's the direction of rotation of this vector. And if we did the same thing with j prime and we wanted to look at its change, it's the rotation of this vector. Is there a way we can get a vector in that direction or in that direction? And there is, which is if we take the cross product of k with this vector, it gives us one in that direction. And if we take the cross product of k with this vector, it gives us one in that direction. So we can replace these formulas with i prime dot is equal to theta dot k crossed with i prime. And j prime dot, lots of dots and dashes, is theta dot k cross j prime. And now we don't have to worry about where the minus sign is. So we get the rate of change of these vectors by a cross product. And even though this is a two-dimensional problem, we use a three-dimensional cross product to get this result. 
Now what we're going to do is define omega, and this is going to be a vector, is the angular velocity vector, is we're going to define it to be theta dot k. So this formula turns into i prime dot is equal to omega cross i, and j prime dot is equal to omega cross j. I prime prime. This prime 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 prime. Okay. I've drawn nothing but primes. We've lost track of our rotation matrix, and that is because we can figure out the rate of change of I prime only by looking at the present value of I prime. Now we can draw this picture again, and if we say we have some object, some object which is going to be rotating around, and let's say this whole object is rotating around, and we can put omega is the angular velocity of this object. So we have the omega vector is equal to omega k. And we're interested in, let's say, the uh, position of B with respect to A. So here's this vector of B with respect to A. This vector is changing in time as this object is rotating around. For example, this thing, we could have kept track of the rotation of this thing as theta. And this omega then would be theta dot. What theta dot is it? It's the rate of change of any angle we mark on here because all angles, all line segments, have the same rate of change of angle. They all make different angles with the x-axis, but their rate of change is the same, every angle as every other. As this object rotates, this vector changes. So here is R of B with respect to A at some time. And here it is at a later time. at t plus delta t, t plus delta t. And how does this vector change? It changes by this thing here, r delta r of b with respect to a. How big is this? That's the change in angle. How big is it after a little time? It's the rate of change of angle times a little bit of time. So we get from that I'll just put it down like this. Delta R of B with respect to A is equal to approximately delta theta times K crossed with the present value of R of B with respect to A. Then if I divide this by T and take the limit as T goes to zero, I have R dot B with respect to, to A is omega K crossed of R of B with respect to A. That's to say any vector, let's call this vector Q, which <coughs> is fixed on a rotating object. has q dot, the rate of change of the vector q is equal to omega cross q. So we have something which is rotating. We can draw various things on there. We can draw an i prime axis, a j prime axis, the position of one point with respect to another. Yes? Um, I don't understand how, like, if you're, like, the diagram behind you, the diagram behind you, yeah, that one. If, like, it's rotating about that point, like, where the dotted line is, like, what is it rotating about? In this case, it doesn't matter what it's rotating about, because whatever it's rotating about, this vector changes 
by this delta theta. So if I took this object and I drew this vector, and it was rotating about this point over here, then the, this vector would move to here. But I want to see the change in the vector. I'm not interested in the change in its position. I put its tail in the same spot. Yeah, I guess that's true. So you don't look at, the, the, when you draw the picture, the vector is moving around somehow, but we want to see how the vector changes. We're looking at how the tip moves relative to the tail. We move the tails back to a common location. It's a good question. Are you happy with the answer? Yeah, yeah that makes sense. OK. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the velocity of one point relative to another, the velocity of b with respect to a, which is equal to vb minus va, and this is going to be for a and b fixed on an object, is equal to omega cross the position of b with respect to a. This is a key formula. Uh, if A happens to be the origin, it tells us that the velocity is a vector tangent to the circle that point B is moving on. So a special case is A is the origin, and this tells us uh, that it has a velocity tangent to the circle or orthogonal to the radius vector. Let's say we want, yes? Yes? So omega. Uh, the vector is denoted as coming out of, into a page. Out does of the page. Does that mean you can say that theta is also like that? Theta is a scalar, so it doesn't have direction. Can I have a theta uh, vector? We don't have a theta vector. We have an R vector. We have a rotation matrix, and we have an R vector. We do not have a theta vector. So I was just wondering, so since, since there is an R vector, there's a B R, capital R, or small R? Yes? We have the R, R position vector, and we have a velocity vector. Now we have an angular velocity vector. Do yes. We have an angular position vector. We don't have an angular position vector, that's correct. Okay. The representation of angle is either the scalar theta or the matrix capital R. We don't have a, we don't have a vector representation representing rotation. Okay. Uh, let me just spend 30 seconds more so I can just get almost done, so I'm going to be a minute over time. If we want to look at the acceleration of b with respect to a, this is d by dt of omega cross the position of b with respect to a. We use the product rule on this. So it's omega dot cross the position of b with respect to a plus omega cross the rate of change of b with respect to a. But this thing, we already know what that is. It's omega cross r of b with respect to a. So we get this funny formula that the acceleration of b with respect to a is omega dot cross of r b with respect to a. This is simple. This is just theta double dot k. This just gives a vector tangent to the circle. That's the theta double dot e theta term. And then we get plus this ridiculous looking term, omega cross omega cross the position of b with respect to a. And this term is one that you can uh, try to think about. Uh, if you look at it and trace it out carefully, I recommend you do that. You will see that this is the centripetal term that corresponds to, the, to theta dot squared times r in the minus er direction. OK, so that's all I want to talk about today. Have a good fall break. See you in so many days.